the wild and majestic exhibition is one very special item, the tartan gown that Isabella McTavish wore for her wedding when she married Malcolm Fraser in January 1785. This dress is virtually the symbol of romantic Scotland. I mean, tartan wedding dress. How much more romantic can you get? Have you seen it? As well as being beautiful and evocative, this gown is unique on several fronts and attracts keen interest from historians with a wide range of specialisms, social historians and archival researchers, material culture specialists like Rosie Wayne, fashion historians like Jonathan Fayers, fashion and costume curators like Emily Taylor, and of course tartan historians like Peter MacDonald. This year marks the first time it has been thoroughly studied by dress historians who specialize in reconstructing historical garments. In June, I led a team in recreating this iconic gown to see what we might learn about it from the process. I'm here today to share our observations and discoveries and highlight possible avenues for further research. The dress is what we today call an English gown, in the period called a night gown, it's distinguished by a closely fitted bodice with a pleated back, worn over boned stays. English gowns derived from mantuas and were made by specialist dressmakers called mantua makers. Mantua making was a highly skilled trade. In France, it was organized and controlled by guilds. Mantua makers served apprenticeships. In Scotland, the evidence shows a typical term of three to four years. Mantua makers worked by cutting and draping on the body. They did not use patterns as we know them. Their stitching prowess was little different from unskilled seamstresses who literally were makers of seams. A mantua maker's expertise lie in the cutting and fitting. An experienced mantua maker could make an English gown in 10 to 12 hours. That is one long summer day or two to three winter days depending on the availability of the client for fittings. Mantua makers generally deferred to their client from decisions on style and fashion. Their job was to make the client's wishes a reality. Nonetheless, their in-depth knowledge of garment construction meant the design and making process was collaborative. Isabella married indoors on the eastern shore of Loch Ness on 12th of January, 1785, in the depths of winter and at the tail end of the Christmas and Hogmanay season. This was a popular time for all kinds of social gatherings, including weddings for rural communities. Her mantua maker was likely juggling several client commissions at once. We observed a number of general points about the dress. The fabric shows no signs of ever having been another garment. The dress has subsequently never been altered, not even to let out or take in a seam. Both the lining and the tartan were cut on the straight of grain at the bodice center front. A little unusual, as normally you want a little bias in the lining at least, to achieve a smooth fit over a curved three-dimensional torso. There were at least two distinct hands at work, notably in the unskilled non-fitted parts. While the bodice was cut, draped, fitted, and stitched with care by the mantua maker, the skirts were assembled and fitted in a hurry with far less precision. It appears that the mantua maker's default mode, in places where it didn't affect style, was typically 1780s, commonly seen in fashionable Italian gowns from this decade. Italian gowns are seamed, not pleated. And that just can't be done with a fabric as thick and heavy as this tartan. But given Isabella's choice of what has to honestly be considered an unfashionable fabric for the 1780s, she may have had a nostalgic style in mind all along. And let's look at that style, shall we? The combination of back bodice pleats with a center closing front bodice was not entirely uncommon during the 1770s when the English gown was going through significant transitions. However, the very wide set alignment of the back pleats is markedly mid-century. It must have been a conscious decision by Isabella to go with such an old-fashioned style. 
We do not know why she chose to go with a contemporary front. Perhaps it was what she was familiar with, and meant that she didn't have to deal with unfamiliar things like robings and a stomacher. It also allowed the tartan set to show to great advantage at the front of her gown. Once Isabella's style preferences were known, it was up to the mantua maker to bring that vision to life. We noted several interesting ways of working, including one series of mistakes, which, for us and for our audience in June, really brought home what a bespoke process this was, and revealed the mind of a mantua maker who could think on her feet, weigh up pros and cons of various possible solutions, and then choose the most expedient one and get on with it. The most marked example of this is in the sleeves. It's possible that Isabella stipulated what length she wanted, and whether she wanted cuffs or not, but a series of events took her and her mantua maker down a one-way street where they were left with no choice at all. First, the fabric was cut in large rectangles, quite wide, of a typical length for 1740s sleeves. At the first fitting of the sleeves, it was determined this was too short, and extensions were pieced in, resulting in a more typical 1780s three-quarter length. But at the next fitting, disaster. The sleeves were too tight for Isabella to bend her arms. Wedding celebrations without being able to raise a glass? Unacceptable. Now we could think of a number of ways to fix this. We're not sure we would have gone for the option the mantua maker chose. She took a pair of scissors and snip and then slapped cuffs on. If cuffs were intended all along, then attaching them instead of the extensions would have produced exactly the same length much more quickly. We can't know for sure why extensions were pieced in, but once they were, and once the overfitting happened, then tackling the tight edge with scissors and covering up the butchery with cuffs totally works for us. Backing up the personal study of about 150 gowns by the members in our core team, we have had on tap access to several more historians, including two who have participated in the Colonial Williamsburg Historic Trades programs, several museum curators, and crucially, Dr. Carolyn Ann Dowdell, who has personally studied over 500 18th century gowns and jackets in the UK alone. The other construction feature I want to highlight today is this. The bodice lining and the tartan body piece were treated as one. The sleeve head was pleated and then slipped in between those layers. Then the back bodice edge was lapped over the top and was stitched down as the final stage. Our collective experience has been that the order of operations seen in Isabella's gown is not nearly as common as one where typically the bodice lining is treated as the shoulder strap. The sleeve heads are pleated and attached down to that strap. Then the back bodice edge is turned in and the shoulder strap is the piece that is lapped over the top to contain in all of the raw edges and the top stitching is seen on the shoulder strap of the fashion fabric, not on the bodice. Looking at Isabella's construction in this area, we've compared and identified out of the hundreds in our team's records, six gowns with somewhat similar construction in this area. They stand out because this is different. Just this week, we were analyzing this admittedly small data set, thinking we may have spotted a trend in dating and provenance for the dresses where this method has been used, but then further data emerged on Tuesday that is prompting us to revisit. Definitely more research needed and in the pipeline on this. Reconstructing an extant garment can take two approaches. You could try and replicate the object itself as closely as possible, or you can try to decipher the processes used in the original creation of the object and then try to walk in those footsteps again in creating a new object using those same processes. We attempted a combination of both in our recreation of the Isabella McTavish Fraser gown. Our foremost priority was to identify, test, and then recreate the process. 
but we had agreed in advance several features of Isabella's gown that we wanted to copy if we could. The most notable are the arrangements and alignments in the tartan set. What colours you see, how much, where, at what angles. This meant taking some arbitrary decisions about things that would normally be the natural result of the fitting process. In other words, a mantua maker's way of working meant form followed function. In our exercise, some aspects of form were fixed in place before we could pursue function. The most significant disconnect that happened for us came in fitting the shoulder straps. Our model's shoulders were significantly wider than what might have allowed us to mimic the smooth, unbroken line of the outer back pleat up and over the edge of the shoulder. In the end, we had to abandon attempts to replicate the order of construction and instead go with the much more common order of bodice strap lining, sleeve head, back bodice edge, and then tartan shoulder strap lapped over as the last and uppermost layer. This was a perhaps inevitable result of making a new gown bespoke for one woman, modelled on a finished gown made bespoke for another woman. And this is a vital, perhaps overlooked, piece of the story. As well as being a romantic symbol, the Isabella McTavish Fraser gown is a lasting legacy of gown making in the Scottish Highlands during the 18th century. It is a product of training, skill and art, but it also shows us the practicalities and the realities that make up this iconic gown.